In this episode, we're following the journey of one Melbourne first home buyer who has conquered the mountain. We're going to hear about the lessons she learned, whether her assumptions were right or wrong, the mistakes she made and those that were avoided, and ultimately how she sealed the deal. Welcome to Your First Home Buyer Guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to move it along and become homeowners. But most importantly, it is for home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mum. And that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 45 years experience to share with you and bucket loads of stories and avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure you get unbiased and real information you can rely on. We've got loads of free tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll get access to our free webinar, How to Buy Your First Home with the Right Amount of Debt. You'll also find the holy grail of home buying education, Your First Home Buyer Guide, the online course of people who want to be educated home buyers. We have created this for you to help you get on the right path to home ownership for your first home and beyond. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field who takes the time to understand your personal situation. We've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change rapidly. So always check with the relevant government authority or your trusted advisors to get the most up-to-date information. Wenda is a Home Buyer Academy graduate, and we're so excited to be sharing her story today. Thank you so much for coming along. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> so exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, this is one of those ones, like, let's start at the beginning. When did you first decide that you wanted to buy a property? So probably, like, after I graduated was, was like when I was like, oh, I'll have a full stable income. Um, I'll have the money to be able to like, you know, buy a house, be able to get a loan, you know, and all my friends were doing it. Um, so I was like really good because like we, I had been working part-time while during uni, um, whereas they had pretty much working been working full-time during uni as well. So they were a little ahead of the game. Um, so like everyone's been buying it. I think it's good to have a place to call your own. Um, so that's why I wanted to like, you know, once I graduated, It'd be great. And then COVID sort of happened. <laughs> it wasn't the best time to start. Um, thinking and like, you know, how everyone sort of changed up jobs, like being a graduate was kind of a little harder at that time when you first sort of walked in. Um, but yeah, started planning from there and probably found their po- your podcast maybe like six months into my search of like sort of planning and just like sort of doing my own thing. So um, it was really good to ha- sort of have a guide and like, you know, hear more about it and sort of just know where to get the information from. Um, so I pretty much started with just sort of like saving, working out my budgets for like the longest time. Um, <laughs> Tell us yeah, more about that. How, how did you come up with the deposit? What were some of the tricks and things that you did? Um, so I think tracking everything that I was spending, which is not for everyone because I'm a bit of an overthinker. <laughs> um, so what I did is probably read books like The Barefoot Investor, sort of just to get my buckets like sort of correct, how much I could save, um, you know, those sort of things and like allocate everything. So I was listening to something once and it was like, I was doing this, but not too sure that it like had a name, but it's called like working with budget zero. So it's like, well, whatever your income is, is what you budget to use for the whole entire month. So that includes savings, that includes expenses and, you know, sort of tracking those down the line. Okay. So say I have $1,000 to spend a week or $500 to spend a week, I'd be like, okay, $50 goes to the insurance I'm going to need to pay at the end of the year, so I'd save away $50 for whatever split of the insurance for the year, and then it'd be like $50 for like my shopping, $50 for food, $100 for food, and vice versa, sort of like that. So you work with Very like always budget and sometimes. Uh, it sounds better, like my budget's sort of always in negatives, so... <laughs> And it was like I was saving but not saving as much as I wanted to but having that mindset kind of just like helped out like work out those sort of kinks um and tracking it so cool. doing th- yeah. simple things like I thought I spent a lot you know but when I sort of like marked everything down and like I still do it now but it's just like 
I sort of do it every couple of days when I forget about it and then sort of like log in my past transactions. So there's like lots of apps that you can look up that sort of help you with that. This is really interesting because it sounds like though you're in a cohort, like your friends were on the same journey. Like you said, some of them were working full time while they're at uni. That's pretty hardcore. And so you basically, this is like delayed gratification on steroids, you know, like you're not even having any fun while you're at uni. You're studying full time and working and saving for a deposit. And this is that's a real long term picture. That's a hugely long term picture. I'm hoping that, you know, you can start to relax now and have fun. Um, or maybe Joe. you can maybe you can share with us how you've managed to have fun in amongst doing that. Like is it is it is it really that hardcore and that sort of dogged and not having fun? Or do you find different ways to have fun because you've got friends that are they're in it with you and supporting each other? Is that the sort of the way it worked? Um, I was a little bit delayed because I think my savings and like stable income was a lot delayed compared to them because I only worked part time. Um, so things that like I pretty much with the budget, I always budgeted stuff for holidays. So regardless of me saving, I always budgeted a bit for holidays and then that money I could spend sort of guilt free. Um, with them, they were like, they had already bought houses. So like all of them have bought houses, like maybe one or two years before sort of me, maybe even three, like it just really depends on the person. Um, yeah, and yeah. Bit of FOMO. <laughs> they're pretty headstrong. So, like, well, yeah, you know. were, were you sort of thinking, oh, how come they can do it and I can't? Because I, I would discourage people from having that. But I'm curious to see if that was part of what you were feeling at the time. Oh my gosh, through the whole time, com- like completely. And because, um, like, I'm an over analyzer, especially like with the type of personality that I am, and I know that not all of them are. So it's like going through the process and listening to your advice and like, you know, not everyone has the same journey. It's like what I'd be comfortable in buying because I have such a long term being like, yes, it needs to be a good investment because I'm not going to live in it forever. Whereas not all of them had that mindset. So it was good to see. But yeah, the FOMO was kicking in through the whole whole time, <laughs> undoubtedly. Um, yeah, to the points where I was like, oh, maybe I should just get something because I know I can afford something. But I'm like, no. I would regret it, whereas listen I know to they the wouldn't. Mums. So, listen to the mums on your shoulder. Yeah. Don't just <laughs> and rush I had a couple, get couple anything. of other people encouraging that too, whereas other people were like, well, you know, you know you can do it. Like, you know, you just need to do it. <laughs> so it was good it was good and bad. Gwenda, when you first yeah. turned up for Campfire, right, so that's our weekly session where we help our students um, and guide them through the process. You'd already, had you, had you finished the whole course when you turned up to Campfire or are you in the middle of doing the course? Oh, it's a good question because I don't think you were there, Veronica, when Gwenda came to the first campfire. I think you were away. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm keen to know. So do you tell? Um, no, I hadn't finished the course. So I had been sort of like, before I signed up to the course, I had been like listening to your podcast. So pretty much up to date, um, listening to a few other podcasts as well. And then, so like I had a good general knowledge, but like, you know, everything was a mess. There were so many things to do because like you guys have so many episodes. So I was like, yes. in my checklist, there was like so many things to do. So um, once I worked out, couldn't afford a buyer's agent, which I wanted to do because I know I overthink a little bit. Um, I was like, look, you know, the buyer's course is great. Like I know there's always my like backup to do it on my own. And like, I've got a good knowledge, just whether I'll be confident in like my judgments. Mm. That's what I was more sort of concerned with. Um, so Going through the course, I had probably done most of it before I started, the, of quite a few parts of it before I started the course, and then it kind of just like sort of smooth lined it, and I was maybe up to like the mid stages because I wanted to do everything really, really well before I moved on. Um, and then there was a couple of properties that had like popped up, which were like uncommon for like my sort of scenario and like the things that I, I wanted. So then that's when I was like, look, I'll get some advice because I have a good general knowledge. I haven't done the full course yet. But, like, I have a good general knowledge and a good gut, so maybe I should just, like, sort of, like, tease it out and, like, see what I'm, like, missing and, you know, just to clear my head a little bit. So that's when I joined the campfires, which was really, really, really good because I didn't end up going to bid for either of those properties and took my time a little bit more and now I'm with the property I have now and I'm really, really happy. (laughs) We are going to get to that. But I actually was in the first time because oh, um, I yeah, went sorry. overseas, remember, and then I came back for a couple of weeks, so then I went back overseas. So in That's that right. time is when you joined us, Gwenda, and I remember you bringing us those two properties saying, oh, I, I feel the pressure. I feel like I need to jump on these. And then we were able to go, hang on a minute, let's just look at the bigger picture. And we sort of stepped back and looked and was like, oh, uh, there's no rush. And so that 
fascinating because then you started bringing us different properties and you started looking at things slightly differently, correct? I'm curious to know what was going through your mind at the time when you felt like you had to act and then then you, you've got to be brave to then not act. Once you've made that decision to act, you got to go, okay, I'm not going to. What was going through your mind at that stage? Um, so the first thing was like, I have to act is because initially that's where I started my searches in that area and worked out, couldn't really afford things that I wanted. So I branched out to different areas. Um, and then what I probably spent too much time doing, like through the process beforehand was doing a lot of like analytical sort of like data collecting and knowledge of like prices, markets, what I'd be happy with without actually going to walk around and actually go to inspections. So oh. I had spent probably, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had spent like three or four months, I would say a good three or four months looking in like two or three different suburbs um, compared mostly to the ones the that desk, I bought in I and the I ones remember. that I wanted in. So at the desk, mostly at the desk is what yes, I remember. Yes, yeah. yes, mostly at the desk because like it made sense to like in that order you need to do your desk research to know where you can afford before you start looking. But mm. I did too much in that desk knowledge, which I was probably one of the things that I would have like said I would have changed is like do a bit just like real, real general, go out to inspect first, go to auctions, look at places and then come back to do that same sort of research. So I kind of missed that step a little bit. Like I still did it quite like quite well for the, the house that I purchased now. Um, but I did miss that step. I think like when I went back to like other places to search, um, so and that's step yeah. five in the um in the pay system, which is at your first home buyer guide course. Step five is yep. revise and correct. <laughs> exactly that. Get out and there, I think inspect I was at, like, three or something yeah. for too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, before even going yeah. to four and inspecting, and then yeah, you know, <laughs> would have been a lot quicker otherwise. <laughs> which is gold. I mean, it's it, it's amazing how much time people spend in planning. It's like a lot of people say to us, "When should I do the course? You know, should I do it when I'm ready to buy?" Well, no, you actually need to do it when you're when you're in that planning phase, when you're in that sort of trying to work out. Well, do I have enough money? What should I be looking for? You know, that sort of trying to to. It's the levers that you have to pull basically before you're actually ready to to act. So that's yeah. pretty cool. So when you actually got out there on the ground, off the desk, got out of your chair and went out the front door and started walking around and getting to know sub, uh, suburbs, what did you learn that was different to what you were learning at your desk? Um, so what I was learning was, I think the surrounding areas, cause the property you buy might be like fine or like the ones that you research, you're like, yes, I'm happy to live there. It's within the distances I want to things. And then when I walked around the area, you could see that, that maybe that was the done up house around the, the area that like had a lot of like dilapidated houses. And then just like walking to those stations, I was like, oh, I have to cross this busy road. I don't like crossing this busy road. There is a lot of traffic here. Sort of knowing how far your house needs to be away from the traffic for you to like not sort of hear it. Yeah. I think that was all sort of like big things. And like I walked like the first time I like did that sort of inspection in like those areas once. I'm like, oh yeah, I've got a good judge of like what I want, what I can afford in this area. And like walking for like three or four like hours, you kind of realize distance actually does matter when you get tired. So it's like don't think about when you've got full of energy you can walk this distance, like a 20 minute walk's fine. But then when you're tired and like, you know, like a daily commute, you'll be like, oh, 20 minute walk is actually a pain. I'm only ever going to drive now. So like walking when you're sort of like tired and like if, if walking distance is important to you, I think that's sort of good to know. Um, because yeah, that changed my whole, like, like a whole suburb that I thought I would buy in. Cause it's got like shops, it's got like things, um, it's like close to local amenities, was just not the place that I wanted to buy and everyone was telling me this like months ago but I was just like this is what I can afford I'm not going to live in it forever it'll be fine walked in there like I don't even want to live in here for like two years so you know <laughs> unless you go up in there and you're okay with that I'm like oh maybe I don't <laughs> maybe I just have to go further out and somewhere else and, and, and yeah. I, I think you, you've nailed it when um and we've got quite a few um personality types like you where you you do overanalyze and you get really stuck in analysis paralysis and getting outside and actually putting your feet on the ground and feeling and experiencing things, it is a really important part of the process. It shouldn't be the decision-making part of the process because we talk about, you know, when you move into that phase, it's about the head being in control, not the heart. But you have to, you, if you're going to live somewhere, you really need to engage the heart at some point during the process to say, 
am I going to really enjoy my life in this place or am I constantly going to be beating myself up saying, I wish I'd done something differently. So good on you for having that, you know, getting yourself out there and, and getting out of the chair and putting the analysis aside for a little bit to let your your heart be part of the process. But then you put your thinking cap back, back on pretty quickly because the type of property that you were initially looking at is different to what you ended up buying. So tell us how that changed for you. Um, So I think I had like a good judge of like what I sort of could afford because I know what I wanted to afford. If I like could afford a house, I'd buy a house, which sort of led me to my property decision in like a different area. Because I'm like distance wise, it's about the same distance to the city as where I am, except for like the certain places I could buy. I could only buy like maybe a unit, a townhouse, like more likely a townhouse, which is small, double story, like, you know, for future planning. I think my life goal was like sort of like have this place as an investment. But after listening to your podcast and like, you know, a couple other things, I was like, okay, what am I going to use it for? Like when it's not an investment or like, you know, future life stages, will I be able to use it? Because if I can use it in future life stages, that'd be better. So I was making sure that it's maybe a property I can retire in. So like, you know, live in it for a little bit, rent it out for a bit. That's when I probably will do like renovations, changes if I need to. And then sort of like future, if it's convenient for like me when I'm old, that'd be great. Or it can continue being an investment. So I was like, those were the two things that I was considering. Um, so that's why distance to a station was really important to me um, because I'm like, when I'm older, I don't want to drive as much. Even just now, I don't want to drive as much um, working in the city. But like, so I had houses that were in certain areas that were close to a station and could afford that until like my properties, cha- my location changed. And then I was like, okay, so not in this location anymore. Now in these two other locations, sort of what sort of aspect, safety, this and that like my own sort of lifestyle changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would have preferred it to be closer to home, which I was lucky enough to afford close to where my sister lives and where my family lives. Um, But I had the option of like, look, you know, I might have to move further away somewhere else on like the west side, which will be a 30-minute drive from family um, because that's what I can afford. So avoiding the new suburbs near my my like my sister and my mum's like area. So instead of going like 20 minutes out that way, I'd be like 30 minutes out like in a completely different side so that's sort of how my it changed is when I was like okay I can't just think about what I want now I'll have to be sort of location based I think what, what's so more. interesting about that though um Gwenda is that you you were thinking about future you which is really fantastic you know because we often this is actually I've been reading something about this recently where we have this sort of bias that we actually think that the person we are now is going to be we sort of achieved, you know, whatever state of mind we are now, and that's going to be static. But we we will we will change, you know. So you're thinking about future you, but in the process of doing so, you're thinking about what other buyers would be interested in that property down the track. Should you go to sell it? So you may not be thinking that. I'm hearing that when you're yeah. talking. I'm thinking, okay, so should this not turn out to be an investment property that becomes an investment when you upgrade or whatever? Should this be a stepping stone property only? Then, then who's going to be your future buyer? And you're thinking about them and the versatility of that property and the, and the numerous different types of people that would be interested in the property now. That's that at its core is the fundamentals of capital growth, <laughs> you know, making sure lots of different types of people want your property in the future. So, and that's really sound way of approaching things. So both for a personal um, approach as well as for that that sort of investment lens. The other thing too that Miguel was saying about, you know, engaging your heart at some point, so many people when it comes to property, they think that that's a silly thing to do. This should only be the numbers. It should only be, you know, using facts. The fact is that homes are emotional. And actually, there's a lot about understanding your emotional response to a property and, and why you want to live there and whatever that actually is at the core of capital growth and, and a good investment choice as well. So ignoring all of that would be at everyone's peril. So we're, you know, we're really glad that you listened to that response to yourself to think, no, I don't want to live there for two years. Excellent, because others wouldn't want to either. So um, great work on that. Now, when you found think the this other, pro- Can I just keep stay on that one just yeah. for a sec? Because the other thing that um, I did see a shift in was you were quite attracted to newer properties that didn't have a lot of work. And um, I remember some of the ones that, that we talked about were in um, you know, smaller blocks, more densely populated, lots of the same thing, but newer. And 
what you ended up buying was actually a bit different. It had a lot more land around it and is a little bit of grandma's house um, or Nana's needs house. a lot of work. <laughs> you know, it needs a lot of work. So you actually had a shift in, in that. And I'm really interested um, for you to share with, with the listeners what what brought you to that change and how do you feel about that now? So I think I was always looking for like the older property, but then I think like ease of it, just like the newer property is always like just attracted and like if they felt fell within the budget, then I was like, oh, okay, like this is good. Whereas it's like the older properties that fell within my budget needed a lot of work and I couldn't afford the renovations for that. So I think that was what eliminated a lot of the old options because when I was looking at old options, I was looking at houses only, um, yeah. especially in my area because there, there aren't very many old townhouses or units. Um, so everything was new if for what I could afford. And even if I could barely, barely afford a house, it'd be like I need at least like 100000 to renovate it. So like it then became out of my budget because you can't loan that. Um, I didn't, yeah, don't have enough for that. But I the property that I bought was well below my maximum capacity which I was going to borrow some money off my mum which was thankful so thankful for her uh, which would be able to make me able to do these renovations so my full purchase price which is why it changed because when I was buying a house I could loan the full amount without having to do renovation so I wasn't like trying to do things without renovations but this place fell within my budget which I could afford to do renovations so I had to have that complete sort of change because the old ones that I could afford were not within my budget because I couldn't renovate and there wasn't a chance that I was going to live in those properties um, in those conditions. And yeah. Like, great if I had an extra bit then, but yeah, that would have changed my whole sort of price point, I guess. <laughs> and just for the listeners, what Gwenda has purchased, which is quite common in Melton, is what's called a villa unit. And so that is where a single level dwelling, often freestanding, not always, but often freestanding, but also with garden. And so you end up with a, in fact, some of the houses that you were looking at, because every week you'd bring us links of things that you're looking at, and we will go through the pros and cons of each one. And some of the houses that you brought to us, which were Torrens Title, they had less land around less them than land. this yeah. property you ultimately bought. Like you've actually got a lovely big garden and lots of potential to do really nice things with that. So it, it's, I just love the evolution of your search and, and, you know, testing out different ideas and different, you know, the idea of not renovating versus the idea of buying with a smaller budget and and value and adding some value adding to value. it over time because yeah. we obviously love that. That's worked for both of us. But it's not for everyone. Um, but also that you've explored that easy option as well. Like, But you you clearly aren't one to take the easy easy route in life. I mean, you... <laughs> You've been saving since you were at uni. (laughs) That's not the easy route, right? No, and I think it's just like with that sort of personality trait for like everyone who's listening, because I'm assuming everyone who's listening has that similar sort of thing, maybe not to the varying extent that I might have. Um, But I remember I think you guys saying that like there was the person who, you know, could, had, had enough money, could save, but just kept saving because they weren't ready to sort of buy. And like they'll never be ready to buy because they've never got that mindset to put into action. Um, but yeah, so like, you know, if you're overthinking things, I think like the campfire was really beneficial. Having the process was really beneficial. Like I had listened to all the podcasts and like lots of the information is there, but like having it sort of streamlined and just making sure you haven't missed anything, being like, oh, you know, looking back at it, um, I'm like, oh, okay, like I didn't fully do this thing that I said in the podcast, but I'm like, that's okay. I went through the steps. I went through pretty much what I needed to go through. Um, everything else was just like extra and I've got to be okay with making that decision if the timing was right and the timing just happened to be really good with like the like how I was feeling you know what I could achieve um yeah so when the timing is right like I don't have to go through all that depth but knowing that I've gone through and like siphoned everything out was really good versus like going through the different podcasts and like sort of categorizing it to like what I, stages I needed to do so I think it, it was really really beneficial especially yeah as I said the campfire sessions and like getting that advice to not overthink things was really good and to calm down a little <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a challenge you don't isn't have it? to rush you just yeah. have to be ready when the right one's there now tell us about that how did you know when you found the right one um so when I found this property it was actually listed probably a while before I saw it just because they were trying to uh, like the place that I bought was four units or four villa units 
um, together. One person had owned it for a very long period of time and now was going to sell it. So initially it was getting sold as all of them together, but obviously I don't think they were getting as much. So then they decided to change it to like units. And I was like, great, I might be able to afford one of them. <laughs> going to it, going through it probably like two weeks before the auction was when I um, found out about it. So I did a little bit of research online. The next inspection was the week weekend before. So that was the Saturday. Um, so everything moved really, really, really fast. And it was like a little chaotic because that week I was also having a surgery. So like I was going to be out for a bit. Get a lot on. Um, but it all sort of turned out really, really, really well. Um, so because I was ready and I had a good gut feel, like I had pretty much most things in place, like, you know, my pre-approval, talked to like, you know, solicitors about like other properties. So the properties that I initially inspected that weren't this, that had um, starters and things like that. Um, this one, because it was owned by just one person, it didn't have a strata. So like, you know, I just kind of know the things that will have to go up when the four properties are sold, we'll have to do a strata or we'll have to at least discuss, negotiate, um, you know, those sort of things. Mm. And like the stormwater, which was a concern to me because it wasn't maintained very well. Um, you know, these are the things that I just knew that I'll have, like these are issues that, that will happen in the future Eyes compared to other places. Open. Yeah. But yeah, but I'm willing yeah. to deal with that because, you know, from my background, um, I'm a structural engineer and I did that a helps. little bit of forensics. So <laughs> yeah, I looked at other yeah. properties and I know what's wrong and what can be fixed. Um, and like, you know, when you don't know that stuff, like just listen to the advice the best that you can. Um, yeah. Not having that gut being like other people seeing it, they'll be like, oh, either there's a lot of issues or there's not a lot of issues. So I'll either know too much or too little. Um, but like, you know, going through that sort of process, like I could see that like this needed a bit of work, but I'm okay to do that work. I think working through methodol methodically is really important. And like certainly what was interesting about that, just for anyone listening, is that so Gwenda bought these four properties effectively for discussion in Campfire. And so we could look at all four of them and go, which is the best? And and then work through a plan to get the best one. You got the one you wanted. So we had a plan A, plan B, right? And you got the one you wanted and that's just fantastic. But there was also a potential for a stormwater easement that we needed to look at. There was a bunch of other things. So we were able to go, right, this is where you go to get that information. Yeah. So you yeah. could sort it through in your mind, know that none of them were deal breakers. Um, we're so thrilled you got the one that you wanted. And that was, well, the whole lot were going to auction, weren't they? So tell us about how you actually snagged it. Um, so after talking to you guys, sort of getting a confirmation because there was another property um, that was really close by that was also going to get sold um, on its own title, um, mm -hmm. those sort of things. So it was after talking to you guys, come down being like, okay, regardless of if I can afford the other one, these ones are sort of have better options, more potential and more likely within my price range. So then I did more investigations on the four units and whether like, okay, if I can't afford the three units, will I be able to afford the two units? Walk after walking through them and inspecting them, I'm like, I don't want a two bedroom unit place. Um, and then I did research on like calling up the council, asking them what sort of the overlays meant because there was a river in the back. Um, checking the easements, um, I even drew everything up because bit of an engineer, so do all the math. <laughs> um, I worked out how much land will sort of be reduced from the easements. Um, because it doesn't tell you how much land is on the easements, how much is not. It just tells you how much from the boundary. So mm. working square meter footage, like what are the properties, the one that I got, um, the easements probably reduced at about 50 to 60 square meters, whereas the other property was about 150. So like the backyard looked bigger and it looked a lot nicer. You could do a lot more with it. But I'm not too sure what was in those easements because all the easements are running in the other ways and all the assets are running the other ways but it actually had less workable area. So if I was ever to put a veranda in the backyard, those ones, like it would pretty much be eliminated in that area if like, you've got a backyard, unless you did a leak. So this is one of those restrictions. So you always yeah. think one of the things that we teach you in your first home buy guide is also the process of working through um, how to get the information to work out whether restrictions are going to be a problem for you in the future. And that's a classic, isn't it? So if you, it's like people, I mean, a different example would be people who are buying a property um, and they want to put a pool in. And if there's like an easement over the back, a stormwater easement over the backyard, or if the sewer line goes under the middle of the backyard, they've got Buckleys in many cases have been able to do what they want without severe modica modification or not doing it at all. 
And well, so conversely, it might be there and it might be scaring other people off, but where you want to put that pool is achievable. I've got a stormwater easement through my property, yep. but it's right at the back of the house. So I've got this huge yard that I can put the pool in, um, but I just need to design the house to fit around that. So yeah. that scared other people off, but it was an opportunity. You go, I can sort that one out. Yeah. It's um, I like I like the red flags that you can deal with, not red flags that yeah, cannot like be dealt that. with. And that's what you're looking at. I mean, obviously you bring the benefit of your engineering expertise and your your career. Um, but you know, there are other experts people can actually get to advise them on this stuff, if that's the case. So once you made your offer, how did you go about that? So, sorry, I kind of like deviated from the previous sorry. topic. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, right. no, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. you realigned me. So, yeah, that's good. Um, so, after our campfire session, you were saying, look, even though you know a lot of these things, it's good to get a building inspector. Um, and it was literally the Wednesday before the auction. So, it was like two days to do an, um, to do an inspection. And I was like, look, but I don't, just don't think that's possible, getting that, getting the report, getting a talk. Um, I don't think that's possible. But I was just like, look, you know, you guys said it look, might as well try. So I contacted, I think, the financial planners that I had um, for the mortgage process. Um, they had a couple of contacts and so they gave me a couple of contacts and I made the call and they were able to do the inspection on the Friday. So I was able to get them to inspect both properties, so unit one and unit two. So the one that I was interested in and the one other one that I might have purchased because these were going on the Saturday. Um, so they were both online auctions. So it'll be Saturday morning. And then the um, other one will be like the first unit, the most desirable one was Saturday morning. Um, and then the other one was maybe three or four hours later, which was the one that I was having, which then like when you guys discussed before, you're like, this is the one that I wanted more, but I don't want to let go of the first one in case there are a lot of buys from this yeah. one. People are rushing for it. Like, you know, it's just so many like unknowns. I don't know how much um, active buyers there are and it's not visible because I'm not actually there in sight. Um, so I couldn't mm. see anything and it was a good thing that it wasn't because I wouldn't have been able to attend the, the auction anyway with my foot. <laughs> um, but you know, having the building inspector go through it on the Friday, he gave me a call straight after, like I didn't get the report maybe until like that night, uh, for me, like right before the auction. But because he had a chat with me probably like 2 PM on the Friday, I was like, okay, cool. Great. There was a couple of other issues that I didn't know about unit one. He's like, look, it's damp in unit one. There may be a water leak in the bathroom. So you might need to fix and renovate that. And I was like, yep, I think I was going to maybe do both. But yeah. that one was slightly newer. So that one was less likely to have renovation works to the bathroom. Whereas the one that I'm buying was a lot older and I was more likely to do the renovation work. So when I got all the information from him, all the things that needed to be done, not worked out, there was no insulation, you know, stormwater and things that, that I knew that I had issues, confirmed it. Um, because I think I had that when I put in an offer, like probably like the next hour or so to the real estate agent, he put it forward to um, the vendors. So I didn't hear from him until actually like nine o'clock that night. He's like, I've only just left, which is the only reason why I'm calling you now, um, but you've got it. So I like, it was only hours before, like pretty much less than 24 hours before the auction that I put in a bid and I was like, my family was like, look, you know, put in what you're comfortable with. You know, you might pay a little bit more during the auction and like, you know, if there's other buyers, but put in what you're comfortable with now. Because if not, the auction's tomorrow anyway. You're going to find out. They're going to find out like, you know, it'll be fine. So put in what you're comfortable with. That's not overstretching your budget. Um, not to just nab it since it's so close anyway, um, because they can just go, oh, I know the price. This is what my baseline is. Um, but yeah, they accepted it like, yeah, within those hours. So May not have been as many buyers for the second property because I was older, but it's what I wanted anyway. So I need to remember that's it's okay. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, it was and, a bit chaotic. And <laughs> we good. know you did you did your price research. So yes, you, you so did. your price that you're prepared to offer was based on evidence. But have you gone and found out what the other one sold for? And I'm well, not too oh, sure if you'll tell me. But I know I will I will let you guys know as soon as I find out. But I'm just like giving them a little bit sort of more time because I was just like, do I just call him just to ask? Because I was like, I don't know. I just said <laughs> <laughs> So it's obviously not well, published. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Um, no, no, no. So, yeah, so the fact it's not is published, that you got so it's a one that you wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and at a price. Yeah. Yes. I want to just go through your journey with um, Home Bar Academy because it's really interesting. You actually downloaded the free mini course on the 8th of May, 2022. Ah, wow. Do you remember yeah. that? <laughs> So then yeah. you did the tutorial 
uh, no, then you purchased your first home buyer guide on the 14th of August, 2023. So you've been listening to the podcast all of that time in between. And, oh, and joined, before that too. <laughs> yeah, you joined yeah. Campfire on the 6th of September. So you did a bit of work on the course, you did some work, and then you, you joined Campfire, which is our weekly mentoring sessions. Mm-hmm. What date did you purchase your home? On, um, on the 12th of October, because it's November now, yes, 12th of October. So literally a like month ago. Two so months after you purchased the course. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is Cute. putting it into action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you didn't rush. And that's the thing, I guess, what I'm trying to say is you did a lot of pre-work to get yourself into a position and were initially a little bit frantic and feeling like you had to run, 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 run. But actually yeah. when you stepped back a little bit and said, no, no, I'm in control here. There are options for me. You you actually moved forward with um, a, a really definite direction without feeling pressured by time. And I think that's just amazing. I'm just so proud. Thanks. Yeah, I couldn't be more happy with the location. Like it sort of, besides knowing it's going to be a big headache um, of like a lot of work. um, But like, you know, I think that's definitely something that I can like work with, but it like hits so many of my boxes. Um, and yeah, because of that, like I got it within a price that I could afford, less stressful, have more flexibility because renovations can always be done a little bit later. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah some of those it, things it, can it just be, be a little ticked work, off along so, the way. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be a bit of complaining, but, um, yeah, no doing it and like, you know, having that flexibility is also really, really good for the people who are willing to renovate, like to know that like, you know, you've got a little bit more flexibility if you have that cash flow instead of using it to the deposit, like using it to renovate. Yeah. I think that flexibility, if anything goes wrong, it's always good. So, and it's amazing what a lick of paint, um, new floor covering. So it might be ripping up carpets and either replacing them or polishing up floorboards or whatever's underneath and new curtains, blinds, like they are and they still cost something, obviously, but a lot of that you can DIY as well. And it's amazing the difference that that will make, even with an old kitchen, even with um, old bathrooms. I've got an investment property I bought back in in 2012 and literally spent about 20 grand. Oh, no, it was a while ago now, a good 11 years now. Um, but, you know, I remember I spent 20 grand on it at the time, just freshening it up. It just looked like a different house. And <laughs> and I'm quite confident. I've seen the photos of this one. I'm quite confident. A similar refresh. And then you can take yeah. your time with the stuff that costs more. The big picture. Yeah, that's great. We are so excited for you. <laughs> we know yeah. when Gwenda said, uh, she sent us a message, um, just for the listeners, Gwenda sent us a message before campfire to say, look, I've got something to tell you, but I can't actually make it at the start of campfire and unfortunately we'd finished campfire yeah. by the time Gwenda was able to join and so we all had to wait until the next week a week <laughs> she made us wait a week work. wouldn't even send a message yeah. to us like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I could go oh, I want to know what yeah. she's done <laughs> we're guessing we're guessing but we didn't actually yeah. know bugger yeah. <laughs> yeah. very 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 good yeah. now tell us how do you feel now that you've got a mortgage because that sometimes for some people a little bit of a fear fear factor you know when i've got this mortgage how will i feel um it hasn't kicked in yet because my settlement's not until january even though i signed it because it is tending it at the moment ah. um, so it's like a little bit delayed so like this kind of gives me good prep time of like what what i want to do what i want to renovate before i actually have to like sort of fork out the costs um I think like talking to the broker and stuff like that and knowing how much my repayments are likely to be and like sort of keeping track of my expenses was probably the best thing um to know that I'd be able to afford it yeah and as well as just like because I had like for me personally I'm very stress head about money so I had my buffer for like if I'm employed for three months will I be able to survive with my expenses at the moment So knowing that I have that buffer already, like just to sort of add to what, like my mortgage repayment, say I do go over what I spend, um, that's important to me to have that sort of stuff worked out and have like that sort of leeway, which is like why I think you guys mentioned in one of your first episodes with um, another co-host, how your property planning and your offset accounts are important. Mm. So me having that money to offset, so it's kind of like, it's pay, like reducing my interest, 
but that money's flexible for if I lose a job, if I have an injury, if I have those sort of things. Yeah. Um, so working out the plan with them for my mortgage um, was probably what sort of, when it kicks in, it won't be as hard because... I have things in place which will make me feel a little more comfortable with how much money I have. And if things go wrong, if I need to get a new car, like if I haven't, like I have enough to get like a really cheap car, like, you know, having those buffers in place that I'm like, if I can do that, I should be able to pay my mortgage. Say I don't have a car and I can't buy that car because I need to pay for the mortgage because I can't afford it. Like, you know, that, that helps me. And it just depends on sort of how risky you want to be. Whereas other people will spend up until the last dollar. I can't do that. I know I can't do that. So that's why I like purchasing ice as well. Yeah, and you're buying on your own as well. And mm. so therefore yeah. we all know when we're buying on our own, we don't have anybody else to sort of think, oh, okay, well, if I lose my job, that's okay because my partner's still working or vice versa. So, you know, I think that you've got a really balanced way of looking at making life easier for yourself. You know, like it's why put more stress on yourself than you need to. Um, so good on you for that. And that will make the transition into actually having all that 30 year, that 30 year debt a little bit easier. And I think too, that you've yeah. bought yourself an asset that you know you can add value to. And like we said yeah. earlier, has got yeah. multiple types of buyers that will be interested in it in the future. And you're going to have three new neighbors also in the same boat, probably. Yeah. Yeah. So for the stormwater that needs to be fixed, hopefully they'll also want to fix theirs and maybe it'll all be a little cheaper. <laughs> Well, you split the cost. Make friends with them. Yeah. 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 And you will, it, it, as a strata complex, you'll be able to split the cost anyway in terms of you've got to get it out of your dwelling, but you've got to get it to the street so or to the to the stormwater. Um, anyway, I'm going to shut up because I am not a hydraulic engineer, not engineer. nor a stormwater <laughs> yeah. expert. But hey, now you've done your to, homework and you know. To, to wrap this up, tell us what advice would do you have for someone who's thinking about doing your first home buy guide course? Um, I think what was really beneficial was the advice you guys actually gave me where you're like, if you really want to shortcut it and like be really, really quick, listen to all the things it'll take you maybe like a few weeks, like a few, like a little bit of time in comparison to how long the whole process takes you. So going through the entirety of the course, not even like doing it at each stage, because like I wanted to do everything perfect at each stage before I moved on to the next one. Like your advice was kind of to go through all the stages which I, I did that first before I did all my sort of investigation into other suburbs I wasn't going to buy. Um, if I did those and was like, oh, okay, you know, once I've like know everything that I need to do, sort of instead of doing the price research in so much depth, like actually go to the properties and auctions with the intention not to buy. So be like, okay, will I like, do I want to buy in this area? Um, check out the area as well as just attend auction so you know what the market's at because with the two properties that you guys said at the start that I was really clean to buy, there's not very many of them. So in my eyes, they were scarce and they are, but they also weren't as demanded in the market whereas no one put a bid for the first place. The second place, there was two bidders. One of them was really strong, uh, which was like the sort of market for the two-bedroom house and it was like a couple with a child. So I was like, okay, they're happy to live in that like buying it on their own but I was like okay it's still further than what I want from a station so like knowing where you can afford and like where the market is at I'm like okay well I don't want to buy in this area as much because even though it's a good asset I don't think it's highly sought after um and that would be like things rental as well like it was close to schools and stuff but I was like okay um that sort of change shifted my change in things. So going out and inspecting to eliminate things and then not rushing into things, I think. Fantastic. So if, if I could summarise that, I'd be saying that in a way it's like binge watching the whole 10 modules or binge yep. doing the whole 10 modules then they enabled you to step back and then go back and revise everything so you had more holistic view, that you were able to sort of rather than be caught up in one part or one step of the process and thinking everything you had to know about just that step, you really understood how everything fits in as a total as a total jigsaw puzzle, if you like, that everything has a pa place um, and it all works in concert with each other. So um, I'm we're thrilled for you. It's so I'm it's really so great. Glad to, you did that because that, yeah. that was one of the things you got a little bit stuck. I'm just said just binge it, just do it, start to finish, get the big picture in mind, and then go back and be mm. thorough in each step as you go along. And I think for you that was almost an epiphany of oh okay, well I don't have to. It's not like I'm studying for an exam. I actually just need to have a look at the whole thing, and then I can come back and 
get my HD Be an in expert. each part of the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Perfect pretty much. Step. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's been an absolute delight, Gwenda. We and we're not going to miss you actually in our campfires because you're going to come along <laughs> gonna and we're going to we're going to talk about what you're going to do to renovate it and add value to the property. So we're not going to lose you. So that's really lovely too. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. So. I think that was also like in future, I was like, okay, as long as you guys are happy, because I know the campfire sessions, like, you know, you're helping people buy their places. I'm like, oh, this is like a little bit sidetracked. But um, yeah, knowing like what renovations I can do to sort of add value versus like, you know, still have the investment mindset since you guys have that appeal of like knowing what people want. So I'm like, I don't want to renovate something that no one wants it, but I think it's okay. Yeah. Like, you know, so I was like, oh, it'd be great to get that advice. Pick the broader Because appeal. I don't know, I don't see him so much. I could, I'm happy with almost anything. So, you know, <laughs> um, having that sort of bar, like, you know, what other people expect instead of an innovation is also like good, as long as it, obviously it's within the budget. Yeah. One of the really wonderful things about Campfire is that, yeah, we're there to help and help give you some, some really targeted advice that you can go and step and move forward, but you can learn from each other. So other people who are looking to buy something, if they're thinking about looking at a property that needs some renovating, you know, when we're having discussions with you about that, they'll be able to sort of get benefit from that. Likewise, the last week in the campfire, we were talking about something uh, with you and other people were getting benefit from that. So I think that that's what's a really nice thing about campfire is that there are people experiencing similar things across yeah. the country, really, yeah. Yeah. and and being able to learn from each other. It's caught it's uh well le- being able to learn vicariously through other people's experience it never hurts very true and 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 i guess the the safety net there is that we are there to step in if there is advice that's a little bit off track uh, oh, and we, you know vastly absolutely. different to property forums that aren't moderated properly you know <laughs> because yep. it's great to give advice to somebody but if your advice isn't right then yeah we're there to go well naturally would I'd, I'd think about that a little bit differently and and i think that's really important because the whole idea is this is actually access to expert advice but without the cost of a buyer's agent um and and i think you nailed it when when you said i really wanted to work with a buyer's agent but it's not economically available to everybody uh and that's the the whole idea of us doing this and and doing it in in a group fashion is that it can be affordable and you can get the access it's just you've got to do it for yourself well very grateful to you guys for your help through all the years regardless of you knowing but like yeah i think that's hilarious too that we had no idea and and (laughs) (laughs) anyway Thank you Bridget, so we're much. So proud of you, Gwenda, <laughs> for story. joining us and sharing your story. No worries. See you guys. In this episode, we've only touched on a tiny part of the huge amount of things you need to know to become an educated first home buyer. There is so much more for you to do. You can learn all of the steps in the right order and avoid all of the mistakes that others have made in our 10-step online course for first home buyers. If you'd like to learn more about the right process and avoid making rookie errors, become an educated home buyer. Head over to the website, check out your first home buyer guide, the course that we have created for you. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you've liked what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. It helps other people find us. And of course, I know it's a bit cringy, but we're going to ask for five stars. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. We hope you've found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with more priceless stuff.